Hello, everyone, and welcome to another series on Voices of Healthcare Cloud. Today, we are really excited that you all have joined us. We have a really awesome session for you planned today. We have um, empowering nurses to collaborate with the Microsoft Health Cloud. And um, before we get started, I am just gonna go through a handful of housekeeping items. We definitely want to encourage our attendees to ask questions. So please ask. In just a minute, I'll show you how you can do that. All of our questions will be moderated so that we won't show them to the general audience and for, at first, unless the moderator shares and publishes those questions out to the audience for a Q&A panel for everyone to see. This is a Microsoft external event, um, so please um, be welcome to um, ask questions. And the, the webcast will be recorded, um, and we will post this out to the blog afterwards. Um, so when um, you're looking to ask questions, at the top right-hand corner, you will see the little um, question bubble. Just go ahead and click that, and it will bring up the um, Q&A panel for you to post your questions. So let's go on to the presentation. As I mentioned, today Voices of Healthcare Cloud is bringing you a solution on um, how nurses can collaborate with um, the Microsoft Health Cloud. Charles Drayton is our Chief Technology Architect for the Health and Life Sciences here at Microsoft, and he will be presenting for you today. All right, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, everyone. My name is Charles Drayton. I am the Chief Technical Architect at the MTC, Microsoft Technology Center in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about what exactly that means in just a second. Um, but I'm excited to have you all here today to talk a little bit about uh, a little app that I put together that was really inspired by something I saw that I think really motivated and inspired me. And this is something that came from uh, something called the Nurse Hack for Health, which is a hackathon that we sponsored with Johnson & Johnson and some other companies um, probably about a month and a half ago or so. And the idea behind the Nurse Hack for Health was to gather a, a whole team of nurses to ask them questions about what can we do with technology to fundamentally change um, how nurses round, how nurses operate. And it was really exciting and inspiring to see some of the things that they put together. So much so that I decided to put together some apps that were actually um, directly informed by the conversations that I had with them. So to start with, I'm gonna show you a little video that will really document what that journey looked like as a whole. You're supposed to be able to do anything with technology, right? So why can't we do it? We found that the critical care nurses in our group, we all had that uh, similar frustration that it was, it was hard to get everyone on the phone to get a report. That would probably take quite a few hours for that receiving nurse to actually navigate and try to find that information in the EMR. You know, our world has been turned upside down in the last uh, eight weeks. We were, um, you know, super busy, able to um, implement virtual care. When a patient is being admitted from the ED, uh, a COVID patient, uh, there is time, limited time in the hand of the nurse to scramble and search for equipment and make the room ready and be prepared for this um, uh, patient. What if the nurse with a quick glance could locate all the equipment needed on this unit? Having these things, like knowing where to go to get them, just really saves like time and effort so that we can focus on the patient. Picture Florence, myself, uh, looking for all this equipment um, in hospital. So A, I think that's that's fabulous. Um, So during 
that time that I spent, which was a very, very long weekend with a combination of about 900 participants, 700 of whom were nurses, and the balance of them were either people who worked in healthcare or were technology enthusiasts or were coaches like myself, who all really helped them to get together and ask the question, why can't we, right? And the big four themes that I saw uh, throughout that weekend were things like, why can't we improve handoffs? That is to say, why can't we more easily transition between the nurse whose shift is ending and receiving nurse? Why is it that it's so difficult to find the notes about what you did with the patient, what you talked to the patient about, what kind of uh, temperature you took with the patient, um, any personal details about the patient? Why is it so difficult to hand that off? The second part of it was rounding from anywhere. And I think that takes a number of, of different forms. So the first part of it is increasingly, especially in light of what's going on with COVID, we're starting to see more remote care. And that can either be the patient is remote, perhaps they are isolated, perhaps they're in quarantine someplace, or we're also seeing areas where the medical staff is remote. So we might have physicians who are actually doing their rounding remotely. In either case, there are increasingly situations where your care is not necessarily going to be in person. So how can we make it easier to do the kinds of rounding that's necessary um, where we're able to have continuum of care even though the model or the delivery of care might be different than it traditionally is. The third will be, how do we know where everything is? And this is something that I, I really was surprised about. Um, I was talking to some of the nurses and they say they might have a 12 hour rounding shift. And during a 12 hour rounding shift, you might spend up to three hours just looking for equipment. Where is the TENS machine? Uh, is there a ventilator that's around? Right? Where do we have the IV machine? Where is it currently? And in many cases, they're scrambling, they're trying to, they're calling up other nurses, they're calling the front desk, they're all over the place trying to track down where equipment is. And that can sometimes be, they said, up to 20 minutes per patient over the course of a shift. And in many cases, that's, that's time that they would much rather spend, particularly in critical care, as an example, where they might want to spend more of the time with patients and less of the time actually tracking down equipment. So how can we make it easier to know where everything is? And a final part of it is more broadly, how do we coordinate care? That is to say, even beyond just handoffs, how is it that we're able to coordinate who is doing what for a patient? How do we know in the event that there is something concerning about a patient that I'm able to now coordinate with whoever the physician on call is, or if there is a primary on call, how do we how do we coordinate with someone who might be a specialist who is on call as well? How do we make sure that everyone is collaborating to deliver the best possible care? I noticed that these are really the four key themes that dominated the weekend with the nurse hacks. So what we did as a result of that was I put together a demonstration that merged some of the demos that I saw um, throughout the course of the weekend. And I turned them into something of a composite that I'd like to share with you now. So I'd like you to meet Sid. And I think Sid is someone who represents many of the conversations that I've had with nurses throughout that weekend. So what we're gonna talk about here is in a digitally transformed healthcare um, environment, what is it that the nurse can do much better that they've struggled with previously? So Sid here, we're gonna talk about how in a digitally transformed hospital system, he'll be able to use technology to more easily review his list of patients and to more easily triage a list of patients as well, to make sure that the patients who have the greatest need are the patients who are seen first and the patients who are seen most often. The second thing is gonna be in a digitally transformed health environment. Uh, how is it that he's more easily able to locate not just equipment in general, but the recommended equipment uh, for each patient? The third part of it is going to be, how is it that you're able to more easily review the patient's chart at a glance? Anyone who is watching this now and you've used an EHR, you know how difficult it can sometimes be to use. Uh, some months ago, you know, my mom was in a hospital and I was watching what was happening and they'd have to log on to the VPN uh, and then they would have to log on to the application. And then once they're in the EMR, they'd have to look up the patient's information and then you'd have to click around from this tab to that tab to that tab and the whole time my mom is looking around, she's looking at me, she's just like, I don't know what's going on here. 
Um, and the whole time, because it's difficult to simultaneously have a conversation with the patient while looking up all this information, a lot of time you see that kind of uncomfortable silence that's there. One second, please. One second, please. How is it we can make it easier to deliver the right kinds of information for the patient so that immediately, as soon as the nurse comes in, the, the nurse knows exactly who the patient is, what they should be talking to the patient about, the measurements necessary to, get to ensure continuity, and then take it from there. And that's really where we start talking about reviewing the patient chart at a glance. From there, we're going to transition a little bit and talk about actually doing a lot of this stuff via virtual rounds with telehealth. And then finally, we're going to talk about how SID is able to reach out to the care team as needed to help coordinate care. So those are going to be his tasks over the course of the day. So let's follow him through. And now let's begin at the clinical access station. So the first part of it here is an example of something called Power Apps. Power Apps is our low-code, no-code application development platform that we have. And it's something that's, as, that's so simple to use that you don't have to be a developer to actually build your own applications. What you're looking at here is a rounding app that'll have a list of the patients that have been ordered by the risk score. And here as Sid, I'm gonna take a look at the various patients along with information about those patients. Frank here, the very first person, we can get some core information about him. We can get his ICD-10 code that actually comes from the EMR. So this doesn't replace the EMR, and it's important to emphasize this. It does not replace the EMR. What it actually does is it applies an, a layer of artificial intelligence through our Azure platform to actually look at EMR data and say, okay, based upon the ICD-10 code and based upon any diagnosis they have, here is the most important information at a glance that you will need as a nurse or as a physician when I'm doing my round. Do you notice here? It looks like the person is considered high risk, high risk band, so that's Frank. He's also considered a COVID-19 patient. We get, a, we get some information about where exactly he is as well, and then some information about what equipment is needed. So the first thing we're gonna take a look at here is, we're gonna take a look at the equipment that's necessary. Now, within the Power App, we have something called IOT, which is Internet of Things, as well as IOMT, which is Internet of Medical Things. Well, what this does, uh, these are all parts of our overall Microsoft platform. And what these are able to do is take a look at devices that are connected um, via the internet and actually get information, including things like battery life. It might include its current location through GPS coordinates. It might include other core information to help the nurse track down where the equipment is. Now, this can take a few different forms. The first form of it here is we can, if we do have, in fact, um, internet connected equipment, we can actually get location information available that can then direct um, that, that can then direct the nurse to the location of it. Now, not all equipment is going to be internet enabled. So what we can do um, in addition to that can be things like RFID. So we can actually pull RFID information and use that to identify the location of equipment when you have equipment that's not internet enabled. That's the second way that we can do this. The third way we can do this is very commonly in recovery rooms and, and, and critical care rooms, there are cameras that are, that are located throughout these areas. So the other thing that we can do is we can actually take the feed of these cameras and then use them to track the location of equipment as well. Either way, we can use some combination of one, two, or all of these methodologies, and we can essentially visualize them inside of this Power App to let Sid, the nurse, know exactly where the equipment is. So the first thing we can note here is, we, we see there's a global med cart that's here. It tells you the location of it, as well as information such as the battery life. We can also take a look at things like equipment that's currently in use. So by clicking into the equipment that's in use here, the IV pump, we notice that this IV pump is considered in use. We can pull alternatives from this. So I can click in and I can take a look at alternatives. And this will actually let me know that a subcutaneous infusion set is a viable alternative for an IV pump, which is currently in use. So I can gather, I can use this to gather all the information here. Now, one thing I wanna point out, this equipment isn't just generic equipment. This equipment was actually sourced by the AI capabilities inside of our platform. So again, by taking a look at the equipment 
and then matching that with the diagnosis, the ICD-10 code, for someone with hypertension, for someone with COVID, these are actually the recommended pieces of equipment that are needed for this patient. So we can actually recommend that to the nurse. So Sid can now look at all this information, gather it all up, and now he can go and provide and begin his round. So let's go ahead and start the round itself. So now we're able to take a look at all the core information about Frank. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out. There's a lot going on in this page. Let's break it down a little bit. The first part of it here is the main card information about Frank himself. Now, Frank is a COVID patient. And as a COVID patient, um, as you might know, the two most important predictors of severity are going to be your SpO2, that is your blood oxygen level, and then your current temperature, um, and then what your temperature is. So if either of those is considered, so if your temperature is considered elevated um, or is considered feverish, that means that that might have an impact on whether or not you're recovering correctly. If your SpO2 is too low, that might mean a respiratory issue. And both of these things are considered front and center. So rather than having to go through the EMR and look, 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 instead, it actually brings the information to you. And this makes things much easier for Sid to immediately begin his course of care for Frank. The second thing I want to point out here is the fact that he's considered high risk. So I can take a look at this high risk um, icon here, and this will include information that will show why he's considered high risk. And a key factor here, COVID-19, but also the fact that there are comorbidities here. That includes things like hypertension and age. Both of those are considered exacerbating factors that can make COVID worse or vice versa. Um, that can actually make things like hypertension uh, more acute when you have COVID-19. From here, one of the things we can do is actually take a look at nurse notes. Now, this is something else that came up during the hackathon. One of the things that popped up is the EMR is really great for having clinical information here, but part of providing a valuable service is actually being able to understand what happened during the last shift, as well as little touches of information that wouldn't typically make it into an EMR. I'll give you an example. Let's observe. Hi, I'm Nurse Jasmine. Patient Johnson is a 61-year-old male presenting to the ED with complaints of right-sided drooping eyelids, headache, and double vision since 2 p.m. yesterday. Vitals are blood pressure 160 over 90, heart rate 95, temperature 97.8, breathing is unlabored. He has a history of diabetes and hypertension. Last dose of metropolol given was at 2 p.m. He was seen by the neuro team. The plan is for MRI in the morning and further evaluation. Oh, and by the way, he's a little hard of hearing, so make sure you talk into his left ear. That's his good ear. Okay, thank you. Now, there's one thing I want to point out there. You notice at the end, she mentioned he's a little hard of hearing in his left ear, so speaking in his right ear. Where would that information be otherwise? Well, when talking to the nurses, a lot of what they said would be, you know, there'd be little sticky notes they'd have all over the place with some of these personal touches. You know, what's Frank's favorite team? How many kids does he have? Things like that, that are sometimes a little difficult to maintain continuity throughout. But if we can make it easier to record some of these personal details as part of their overall profile, you're able to have a more personal touch. And particularly for patients who have COVID-19 and might spend long stretches of time isolated, that makes all the difference in the world. Let's continue on here. So here we can take a look at things like their current medications and I can search through additional medications. And here's where AI comes back into play here. So AI will have these insights that will give Sid core, really important information about what's been going on with Frank. So the conversation with Jasmine is great and she's recorded that information there for me. But the insights here can be AI driven and it'll let me know information about things like possible interactions. So if he's taking certain medications that maybe may have interaction that might be questionable, the AI insights can actually float that to the top to let Sid, the nurse, know more about that. It can also include things like interaction between medication and mealtime. So as you might know, if you work in a medical field, the time that you take medication relative to the time that you eat can have a significant impact on, uh, on your absorption ability of the medication and can have an impact on things like potential side effects. So the AI is actually able to look at that 
and then float that again to the top as a potential warning of an interaction. We can also take a look at connected medical devices. So various types of um, you know, connected vitals devices here, we can take a look at and actually use that to give additional types of recommendations. So as a diabetic, we might see, hey, there's been a recent increase in this A1C. It was previously under control, but perhaps because we didn't keep note of that necessarily, um, we've seen a spike there, perhaps because of the fact that he has COVID-19. So we might make recommendations about things like uh, dietary changes or perhaps um, introducing medication if he was previously undiagnosed for uh, having type 2 diabetes. And then finally, things like a recent decrease in his SpO2. So in this case, that might be cause for a respiratory evaluation. So AI really becomes a useful way of providing some additional insights that can help guide the course of care, not just for nurses, but as a rounding out for physicians as well. Now scrolling down here a little bit, here what we're actually looking at is a Power BI dashboard. So Power BI is our BI application, and this is something that you notice we can actually have embedded inside of our Power app. So this is one of the great things about the Microsoft platform as a whole, the ability to start embedding things. But you notice as I'm scrolling here, I can actually take a look at their overall history. So what their oxygen saturation level looks like relative to a baseline. So this will actually give me some good insight as to whether or not Frank in general is getting better. What we also notice here is we have a virtual nurse where I can ask questions in natural language. So things like what was his SpO2 reading? When was his lowest SpO2 reading? What are certain things that are going to be um, concerning about his medical record? And again, compared to having to dig through the EMR, by actually connecting this via our fire connector to the EMR, we can actually just ask questions of the medical record and then have it answer the question in natural language, similar to what you saw there. This makes the entire nursing experience much easier um, and much more seamless in a nutshell. These are things you can ask about while having a conversation with the patient. So you get that more personal touch as a whole. All right, so let's now kind of circle back here. And now back on the homepage. And let's pause for a second. Um, any questions so far coming from the audience? Charles, we're getting this question about um, Epic integration mm -hmm. and integration with other EMRs. Can you speak to how you accomplish that or how that can be accomplished? Yeah, um, the effort required? yeah definitely. So there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, so we, you, there's something called um, the, the Healthcare Accelerator. And the Healthcare Accelerator um, makes use of the FHIR standard that can connect to um, EMR data. And there is a free version of that that works with our Power Platform. So that includes things like Dynamics. It also includes Power Apps. Um, so it uses something called the Common Data Service where we can actually connect to clinical data as well as back office data. We can, and, and we can essentially replicate that inside of our common data service database, which would actually be surfaced through this Power App that you saw. Now that's if you wanted to build an application that made use of EMR data. If you wanted to get a data feed for reporting purposes, we actually have something called a Fire Connector. And that's something that works well with Power BI, which is what you saw a little earlier to visualize things like their temperature readings or their SpO2 readings. Now, this can actually grab information that can come from um, that can come from the EMR. It can also grab information that can come from medical devices, vitals monitors, as an example, that we can grab um, that that might be fire enabled. And we're increasingly seeing some smart devices like um, you know like respiratory monitors and blood pressure monitors and various types of cuffs that are actually enabled. To, to get a fire feed of data that we'd be able to visualize. And both of those are things that are out of the box with Microsoft. Thank you, Charles. There's another question about IOMT um, and what type of devices can be connected to the platform. Um, people have different types of physical devices and figuring out that, you know, uh, operability with, with this type of platform is, is, is a key decision criteria. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So uh, IO, IOMT is basically IoT, 
but it also includes a couple of um, medical specific, fire specific endpoints um, that are part of that. It also includes certain you know, security parameters um, added, embedded into that as well to maintain things like HIPAA compliance. So not every device is IoT connected. There are certain devices um, that, that are connected and we have a, an entire partner ecosystem using you know, partners like you know, Stryker as an example, Hillrom is another one, a number of other partners that we have, um, CloudDX, um, that all make use of IoT or IOMT connected devices that we're able to connect to. Now, if you wanted to build your own, um, you know, the, there are a variety of different tools that are available. It might be a little out of scope for this, but things like you know, IoT Central as an example that you can actually use to IoT enable some of your devices. Um, and then you can build some of the protocols into that to, to, to include some of the security capabilities and then some of the fire specific endpoints that differentiate IoT from IOMT. Thank you, Charles. We do have a few more questions, but uh, let's hold them off. They're generic, so let's hold them off till you finish your presentation. All right, perfect. Great, so let's do a recap of the first part of this year. So Sid, we had an opportunity to see a couple of things. So the first part we had an opportunity to see was how he was able to use this app, this combination of Power Apps and Power BI and, and combined with some of the IoT type capabilities, combined with the Azure AI capabilities to actually do some of the improving of handoffs. Um, so we got to see how Jasmine, the previous nurse, was able to hand off to him fairly easily with a combination of clinical information and then non-clinical information that's useful for nurses. We were, and we were able to, to also see knowing where everything is. So the ability to track down the necessary equipment um, as well as the equipment that's recommended for the patient as well. So what we'll talk about next is going to be rounding from anywhere and then coordinating care. So let's fast forward a little bit. Then let's say that Sid has completed his rounds and because of social distancing policies at the hospital, he has to do a couple of days per week of rounding at home. So now let's transition to home and let's spend some time talking about what the other two pieces are going to be. Rounding from anywhere, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, and then coordinating care. So this is Microsoft Teams. So we noticed from within Teams, over on the left-hand side here, we're able to get a lot of information specific to the clinical practice. This might include things like the various hospital departments that are there. Um, it might include things like some of the exam rooms that are here as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. Virtual rounding takes on a lot of forms. So you actually have the ability, and we've seen this with a couple of hospitals, to actually set up a version of Microsoft Teams inside of physical hospital rooms, where in that scenario, you might have someone who's doing rounding remotely and they are elsewhere and they can actually connect to the patient who would have teams on a tablet, for example, or on a laptop inside of their hospital room. And you would actually be able to do your rounding from room to room that way. So what you saw with building one exam rooms, that would be an example of that. So to give you an example of what that looks like here, we can click into this. And now you actually notice here, these are the people inside of each of these rooms here um, within the app as virtual enabled. So we notice here, instead of looking at equipment, it actually says start call. So I can actually start a call directly with Frank. So I can follow up with Frank being Sid, and I can now have my conversation with him even though I'm rounding remotely, or even though I'm working from home. The second part of this here is actually where perhaps I'm at home and perhaps where the patient is at home as well. So we look here at the second part of it, and this is home care rounding. So we can click into home care rounding. And now I'm able to take a look at someone who is currently at their own home. And from here, I can start a call from here. So when I start a call, it's going to start a team session with them. But what we'll notice here is it's going to be that same app, but it's going to have a somewhat different look. So in this case, we're actually going to have some home issued devices where I can take a look at things like their blood pressure, their temperature, other information here, and I can get some given insights that'll take a look at the fact that, for example, blood pressure is 4% over previous reading, but 8% over demographic averages. I can also take a look um, more specifically at things like their temperature readings based upon their home devices. So we can take a look at temperature trends as an example. I can also take a look at their care team. 
So I can, by looking at the physician who is on call here, even during this team's remote session, I'm able to look at who is on call. And even though Dr. Beth, who is the cardiologist on call, um, is, going, is going to be remote as well, I can connect to her via Teams too. So now we can have an entire conference call between Eden, who is the patient, um, Dr. Howe, who is the physician, and myself, Sid, who is the nurse. So what that would look like in this case, and this is probably a little bit of out of scope, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, is this. So essentially what we're looking at here is an additional layer of EMR information that would exist and actually be surfaced directly inside of Microsoft Teams. Um, and in this case, this would be the view that Dr. Howe would see. So rather than just having a nurse app, which has a limited subset of information specific to what I'm doing as a nurse, I'm gonna see more information as a physician here, which might include information such as care plan information here. Um, you might get information about their overall timeline. It might include information about care plan activity that took place to make sure that the patient here is actually following through with everything that became part of the overall care plan. So that continuity of care, that coordination of care as I transition from the nurse to the physician while still maintaining the session is something that, that really comes in handy when you're doing that kind of um, continuous virtual care. Okay, but again, that's something that's really a story for another day. And I'm happy to spend some more time talking about that um, if there's interest about what that physician view might look like. But I really want to spend most of my time talking about the nursing rounding app. Let's do a quick recap and then we'll transition over to questions here. So um, we talked about improving handoffs as a whole, and that was the first part of it. How do we then transition from nurse to nurse? We talked about knowing where everything is. Um, so how do we identify the recommended equipment when you're providing care for patients, um, when, you're, when you're doing your in-person rounding? And then we also spent some time now in this section talking about being able to round from anywhere, whether I am remote or whether the patient is remote or whether the, the patient is in isolation or they're at home and then being able to coordinate care. That is to say, how do I seamlessly transition where necessary um, based, upon some, uh, based upon some vitals or based upon the conversation that I'm having with the patient to whoever the physician on call is in a nutshell, okay? Before I transition over to questions here, let's talk about some next steps for you. So some of these things you saw here might be really interesting and really exciting, I hope so. So your next question might be, that's great, how do I make it happen? Um, in the Chicago MTC, we have something called the Intelligent Healthcare Experience. And what the Intelligent Healthcare Experience is, is a collection of about five different kiosks that comprise, at this point, probably close to about 20 different demonstrations that follow the journeys of 10 different characters who all work together to help the patient, Frank, recover from a medical emergency. So some of these roles include technology that helps to support the patient. So we have various types of patient engagement capabilities. We have things that help with the EMT. We have various types of um, ambulance technology available. We have primary care technology available. We have specialist um, types of technology available for everyone from you know, specialists to surgeons, radiologists. We have back office capabilities that include things like revenue cycle management. It can include population health type capabilities. Uh, it can include triaging, huddle capabilities. We even have um, adjunct capabilities as well. So capabilities for people who are in pharmacy. So what might the pharmacist technology experience look like and how can we do some of the prescription management and some of the opioid abuse catching capabilities as well. We have various types of scenarios for people like home care nurses from follow-up care. And then we even have things like call center or patient access center. So what happens when a patient calls about their bill or they want to be able to make an appointment? What kind of technology do we have that can support that experience as a whole? And in a nutshell, you know, throughout these five different types of kiosk, we have technology that can really correspond to the entire continuum of care. So if you saw things here today in the you know, 20, 30 minutes that we've had, that's great. And I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about that. If there are things that are outside of that that you'd like to talk about as well, we have that covered too. And it really goes through the entire experience of care for everyone who is involved with it, whether you are a patient, 
a primary care physician, a specialist, a hospital administrator, um, or someone who is a provider of care or, or, or someone who provides extended care um, for, for part of the overall healthcare experience. We have something for you, okay? So what one of the things I offer is an envisioning workshop. What an envisioning workshop looks like in a nutshell is essentially you come in and uh, we'll spend some time together and we're, we're offering these virtually as well so you don't have to come to Chicago. Um, you'll come in and we'll spend some time talking about what your priorities are, right? Are you primarily interested in, in chatbots, right? Are you primarily interested in uh, patient engagement? Are you primarily interested in care coordination? Whatever these things are, I want to get an understanding of what your overall vision is, what your overall key performance indicators are. And based upon that, I'll then walk you through the appropriate combination of technology that will help with whatever these needs are that you might have. So once we give you these demonstrations, we'll then come back and we'll use that to build an overall roadmap for how you get from where you are today to where you want to be. And that might be, hey, I want to understand a lot more about um, you know, patient engagement and some of the technology around that. So maybe we'll do a deeper dive into what bots might look like, right? We might do a deeper dive into, um, into the difference between a health bot and a power virtual agent. You know, this is all, these are all tech terms, but we're happy to do a deeper dive into that. And then ultimately use that to determine what your next steps are going to be in terms of digitally transforming your, your overall experience. Um, so that's what the workshop as a whole looks like, okay? So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, um, go to microsoft.com forward slash MTC, or if you have an account manager at Microsoft within healthcare and life sciences, get in touch with them and tell them that Charles Drayton with the uh, Microsoft Technology Center is offering a workshop and you'd love to take part in that. All right, so that's all I have. Um, let's transition to uh, any questions from this point on. Love it, Charles. Um... Just a quick question on the workshop. Mm -hmm. Is there a cost associated with the workshop? If if I'm a enterprise customer with Microsoft, uh, what what's the red tape involved? Yeah, great question. There is no charge uh, at the Microsoft Technology Center. All of our offerings are at no charge. Um, so we can, we're essentially a series of free consultants. So even if they are things outside of clinical, right? I want to know the best practices for adopting Microsoft Teams. I actually have an entire team of people at my MTC who can cover everything from Azure to Microsoft Teams to data to artificial intelligence. I have a data scientist PhD on staff to Dynamics to Power Apps, Power Platform, and all the different types of workshops and different types of uh, architecture design sessions and consulting engagements we have are at no charge. Great question. Awesome, thank you, Charles. There's there's a comment slash question from from the demo, mm -hmm. um, and they ask they're a little confused about the idea that something is not available in the EMR, right? As pretty much all of the charts that you presented, SpO2, Vitals, etc., they are visualized in you know sort of the two leading EMRs, Epic and Cerner. What is the added value of of you know, the AI ranking, um, like is, is the, the whole purpose of that visual that you presented, the added benefit then only the, the risk or the AI ranking of patients according to risk? Or can you speak to what other gaps is that filling? Yeah, correct, correct. So we're not looking to replace the EMR. In fact, we rely on the EMR for some of this data. So this goes back to the scenario that I talked about um, in the morning and from talking to a lot of the uh, nurses during the nurse hack where they say, you know, I, I log into the EMR, you know, I got to log into, um, I, I've got to look up the patient information. I have to look through the EMR. I have to click through this. I have to look through this note. I have to look through that just to try and figure out where things were left off. And in many cases, the continuity is something that gets broken because you're starting almost from the beginning when you're going into the EMR. The AI can actually take the EMR's data and make that the very first thing that you see. So we grab the data from the EMR and the very first thing that you see when you log in, because Frank is a COVID patient, is going to be his temperature and it's going to be his SpO2. I don't have to look anywhere. I don't have to dig in anywhere. It actually floats that information to the very top 
as the very first thing I see. And when talking to the nurses um, and when they you know, helped to design a lot of this, they thought that that was really a godsend overall to be able to just have the information presented to you instead of you having to dig around for it. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Charles. Um, important question. How do we get this solution implemented in our organization? And how can Microsoft help? Plus, if you can talk a little bit about the building blocks of the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. OK, um, great. Yeah, so the first part of it is uh, that intelligent healthcare workshop is a really great, great place to do that. So, you know, going back here, for example, um, over the course of one day, sometimes a day and a half, sometimes two days, we can actually help you to architect this solution. What you saw there might look a little different for you, right? So maybe you are primarily interested in doing some of the device tracking, and maybe you just want to stick with just having the EMR. Or perhaps you want to be able to have some of the intelligent surfacing of clinical data, but maybe you don't necessarily need the, the equipment tracking part of it, right? And one of the things that we'll do is we'll figure out, a, we will help to architect what the solution would ultimately look like for you um, based upon the requirements that you have. So hopefully this part of it um, will have answered the first part of the question here. And we have an entire team of people who can help you figure out ultimately what the deployment will look like. And then the actual deployment itself would typically be handled by a partner if you're working with a partner already or with the Microsoft Consulting Services, um, and they'd be the people who actually do the hands-on deployment of things. Um, that being said, you do have the ability to build some things yourself. So we talked about that nurse hackathon. So there are lots of nurses there who had never built anything before. And over the course of the weekend, they actually built some pretty good things. So, you know, while you can, you know, do a, a higher professional to deploy a lot of this, and given the complexity of some of it, it's a good idea, you can actually build apps that will make use of EMR data on your own. And I think that was something that we showed during that nurse hackathon with a series of non-technical nurses um, actually building some, some pretty impressive apps. Um, and the second part of the question was uh, the underlying components for this. So the underlying components for this um, were the, uh, it was power apps that made use of the common data service and a common data service, think of it as, uh, the fastest way to define that is kind of like your own personal instance of Azure SQL with a bunch of API and front end capabilities that sit on top of that to allow me to interact with the database without having to know any database queries. Um, so there's a CDS part of it. There is the healthcare accelerator that sits on top of that that essentially communicates back via fire with the EMR to bus the data from the EMR into CDS. And then the Power App sits on top of CDS and will actually visualize the data. And that'll be in the form of the patient's information, the patient's vitals, the patient's history, et cetera. Um, and then there's Power BI, and the Power BI is the dashboard that is that also uses the fire connector to connect specifically to your IoT data for your connected devices, real time, by the way, um, as well, as well as your EMR data. And it can combine the both of them and make that available for Q&A with the Q&A portion of the um, Power BI dashboard. The final component of that is Microsoft Teams. And you have the ability to take that application and embed that inside of Microsoft Teams, where you would be able to use that um, while having a conference call or while having um, you know, a remote session with a patient or with another physician. I think I've got all of that. And there, awesome. and then there are a couple of other components to that as well for doing some of the, and this depends on how you're looking to track down some of the equipment. So some of the IOMT or some of the, um, or some of the uh, cognitive services embedded inside of cameras. And these are all things that based upon the current topography that you might have at your hospital could vary in terms of what we would use to try and track down equipment. Thank you, Charles. Um, one quick question about logistics. What if somebody is not located in the Chicago areas? Are these workshops offered virtually or are they offered in other parts of, of the country? Yes, we have uh, 15 MTCs around the country and about 50 worldwide. Um, the Intelligent Healthcare Experience itself is located in Chicago only right now, but 
I am able to do uh, these workshops virtually. The tour itself, we're looking to launch a virtual version of the tour, probably sometime within, ah, uh, so busy, uh, within the next four to six weeks. Um, I'm looking to launch a virtual version of the tour, but the workshop itself is something that I can do remotely. It's something I've been doing remotely. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment that um, in the chat from Michael, and he says that, you know, you'd love to have this as a video that could be sent directly to a CNO. Minus all the techie stuff, so focusing on the on the four pillars that you mentioned handoff, surrounding, you know, equipment management and coordination. So any thoughts and any plans if you have on promoting this further um, just just for the clinical leadership? Yeah, I, um, yeah, actually it's not a bad idea. Um, I might put a little something on YouTube, um, maybe a couple of versions of this one primarily clinical and then maybe another one that gets a little behind the scenes uh, if there's interest in that. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Well, that's all the questions I have. OK, I'll turn it back to you and Shelley. All right, I think that is all I had. Um, but if you need to get a hold of me um, for anything, I am Charles Drayton, as you can see right here uh, at Microsoft.com. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, but if you wanted to schedule something with the MTC, um, please do that through your account manager. Um, I cannot schedule things directly with customers. Um, it would be done um, by your account manager on behalf of your company or your organization. Awesome, Charles. Thank you so much for your time today. And everybody who is um, on the call, we really appreciate you um, coming and posting your questions. After this is over, we will be collecting some resources for you to share. This has been recorded, so we will kind of trim up the recording and post it back into the blog that you can find at aka.ms slash HLS blog. Um, and any additional resources that Charles feels inclined to share, like how to get in touch with the MTC, how to look at the um, workshops or a list of workshops. Also, if he does um, get a chance to post his YouTube um, video as, as asked by the audience, we'll be sure to link it on our blog as well to make sure we get you all the great resources that we have available for this solution. We are so thankful for all of you um, for participating today. Also, one last plug, the Voices of Healthcare Cloud is a series, so we are doing these at least monthly, if not more frequently, as new healthcare solutions come into the market with Microsoft Healthcare Cloud, we will be sending out new meeting invites for additional series. So please watch the blog and watch your um, invites coming through, and if the topic seems interesting to you, we would love for you to join us and share it out with your colleagues and coworkers and friends on social media to bring them in to participate in these events as well. Thank you so much for your time today and please look forward to posting the recording um, this afternoon. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you everyone.